you all for coming. It's a beautiful Thursday afternoon out there. Uh, so I, what, I, what I wanted David to do was start us off with telling us a little bit about his journey and giving us his perspective on what he sees as the future of digital currencies. And I told him to take his time doing that. So let's, let's kind of hear from him for a little while about his journey and the future of digital currencies. David. Thank you. Um, so I started out as an electrical engineering student at the University of Houston. I promised not to tell any of my YouTube jokes. <laughs> I have a whole bunch. People seem to like them, but I'm not good. No, I'm not going to. I thought about it for a minute there. No, I'm not going to do it. Sorry, any of you who wanted a joke. Um, I, I was very interested when I saw Bitcoin in 2011. I think that was a real inflection point in sort of my intellectual journey. I had been working mostly on cryptography-related things. I was developing secure messaging and cloud storage systems for government and military. And um, I was definitely looking for something a little more interesting and more, more satisfying to work on. And I found Bitcoin. Um, I actually found it from a website called StumbleUpon, where you tell it what you're interested in, and it tells you what you should be interested in. And it said, you should be interested in Bitcoin. Well, it was, it was right about that. I'll give a plus one for StumbleUpon. Um, and when I looked at Bitcoin, the thing that really just kind of interested me was this idea of sort of, of liberation, of sort of not having gatekeepers or sort of centralized barriers. And I think if you look at the internet, that's exactly what happened there. I know the internet's backslid a bit on that lately with, you know, like social media becoming like arbiters of what can and cannot be easily said and heard. But still, if, if I want to say something and you want to hear me, I can create a website, I can create a blog, I can create whatever I want, and all of the people who want to hear me can find that information. And most of you are too young to remember the battles over, over the web, but th that did not happen by itself. That's not the way the world has always been. It used to be that you had to get like published in a newspaper if you wanted people to hear you. And that was hard to do because newspapers had control over what you could and couldn't say. And if you're, what you wanted to say was too far out of the norm of what people, what they thought people wanted to hear, you just couldn't get an audience. And a lot of things that we accept today were way out of the window of what would have been acceptable not very long ago. Um, gay marriage would be a good example. Like the, we, we all accept that today, most of us at least, I hope, as just, that just the way it works. Like maybe it's always been that way. Y you could go back 30 years and you probably could not have written an article arguing for, for, for e those types of rights and gotten, it, and gotten any traction anywhere. It was just too far out of the mainstream. And I think you can, create, you can think of all kinds of other examples of, of, of social change, of, of just freedom of expression, just art. And how do you get your art seen? How do you get your music heard? Just like the ability to, to spread your word. And I think that was instrumental in the way the world, the world worked at the time. Like if you look at North Korea, people in North Korea thought that in the West, Kim Jong-il was like a respected intellectual. I know that sounds, <laughs> he was not. Spoiler, he was not, right? <laughs> you know, right? Um, but, but people in North Korea, may, they were told that, you know, health care, nobody has health care in the United States and people are living on the streets. And, and that's not not true. It's just that's not an accurate picture of what life in the United States is like. But he was able to maintain that lie because there weren't sources of information outside of his control. And when I saw Bitcoin, what I saw was that we had something similar happen in finance. If you look at Venezuela, um, there is no alternative to using the state currency, and the state can devalue that currency, and they can essentially take money out of, your po out of the pockets of anyone they want to. Um, financial systems in many countries are used as sort of uh, roadblocks. They're used as choke points to prevent people from getting, uh, you probably, many of you may know that cannabis businesses that are legal on the state level and illegal on the federal level have difficulty getting access to banking because it's illegal on the federal level. And like the federal government is using its control over the financial system to exert leverage. And whether you think that leverage is, is correct or not, you certainly, I hope, would agree that there are governments that, you know, of repressive countries that are using that leverage in bad ways. And so the technology that I saw in Bitcoin had the potential to democratize the movement of money the same way the internet democratized the movement of information. And that was tremendously exciting to me. And um, an analogy I use sometimes is the Ford Model T. Like people saw the Ford Model T and if you were a visionary, you could say, oh my God, this is gonna replace the horse. But not literally the Model T. Like anyone here drive a Model T? If so, I'm jealous of you, but right? Like the technology, you could look at the Model T and say, you know, it's, it's expensive, it's slow, it, it doesn't get, it, it needs maintenance frequently, but like none of those things are fundamental to the technology. Those are just limitations of the technology today. And I started to look at Bitcoin and I said, well, what are the limitations of the technology? 
and there really weren't that many. Scalability was probably about the only one. We're still work, we're working on that, but like other than that, it just seemed like this technology could be really transformative in a number of businesses. Um, and then we had the crypto winter when the price of Bitcoin and other cryptographic assets dropped, and everybody's like, oh, that's over. But you know, we had a dot-com boom followed by a dot-com bust. Does anyone think the internet's over? Like, you know, some of those companies rebounded a little bit, and um, the bad ideas got shook out. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of happening in the crypto space too. The bad ideas are getting shaken out. But I also just want to say one other thing, which is like one of the reasons that I come to universities is because this is a super exciting space and it's cross-disciplinary. Um, information science, computer science, cryptography is obvious, but then like finance and governance and, and politics and there are all these other aspects of what blockchain is going to do. How do you govern a blockchain system? Like, there's all kinds of interesting questions in the space, and if we want to advance this space, like the internet was something that a lot of the greatest minds of, of a generation worked on, and we have the internet because of that. And I want to see those minds working in the blockchain space, and I want to let you know that like, even though the cryptocurrency prices have dropped, there are still a large numbers of companies, my own Ripple included, that are building in this space that are trying to figure out what, how to you know, bring this technology to mass adoption and it's just an incredibly exciting space to research and work in. And by the way, the winter is good because they told me in the business school you should buy low and sell high, so it's buy times. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, one of the things that, uh, that sometimes I'll hear people say is like this pattern has repeated four times and every time it like immediately set new highs. That's true until it isn't. Yeah. You know, there's no one of the first things you learn when anyone talks about any investment is to say that there's no guarantee that the future will look like the past. But I mean, the best data we have on what the future is going to look like is the past. So yeah. it's kind of torn. Uh, is this the last? Is it not? I who mean, uh, yeah, who knows, right? So, so, so don't all go out and buy Bitcoin. That's not, <laughs> that's not what we're trying to say here. David, we'll edit that out of the video. <laughs> so, so share with us what is Ripple's vision what kind of problems are you trying to solve? I think you could look at it at, at multiple levels. I think kind of like the high level visionary statement is we want money to move the way information does. We talk about the internet of value. Um, we want money to be, if I want to send you an email, I just ask you what your email address is. I don't ask what mail service you use or, or what internet service provider you have. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. But if I want to send you money, it's, it's, a, it's a huge mess. PayPal and Venmo are owned by the same company and they don't interoperate. Seriously, I'm not kidding. They're owned by the same company. They're U both U.S. dollar domestic payments, among other things. They don't interoperate as U.S. dollar domestic payment systems. Like that, that's ridiculous. So that's kind of like our broad vision. Um, our shorter term vision is to find the problem that we can solve that has the best product market fit. Because like that's a, that's a, that's a huge problem, right? There's no way that you can you could try to get like do we try to make PayPal and Venmo interoperate? Like is that what we're about? Like how do you fix that? I think the short term we we picked what we think is the low hanging fruit, which is international payments, cross currency payments. Uh, anyone who's ever made one will tell you they're terrible today. One of the biggest problems is nobody knows where the money's going to go until the payment's finished. They just sort of push it and then it takes a few hops and eventually it gets to the recipient or there's an error along the way, but nobody knows the rate because they don't know the path it's going to take. Um, so our shorter term goal is to remove friction from international payments. And we've been building a payment and settlement network that we call RippleNet for banks and financial institutions to do that and to allow them to settle with a cryptocurrency. Um, and that's kind of like our shorter term vision. But there's another important piece too that I think is, is lost on a lot of people. And I'll use the same analogy that I like to use a lot. Like imagine if you were the CEO of Twitter in 1996. Now there was no Twitter in 1996, so this is a pure thought experiment. You'd be like, oh my God, people need better phones. And everybody else would be like, wait, what? Like you're not in the phone business, you're, you're, you're a website. Why do people need better phones? Like trust me, no. If I'm gonna get mass adoption, people have to have much, much better phones than they have today, and you would be right about that. Like there has to be an entire ecosystem. And so what Ripple has recognized is that we can't build an ecosystem all by ourselves. So we need to encourage people to build useful projects, do research in the space, and sort of grow the space as a whole. And, and if you look at the cryptocurrency markets, which I encourage you not to do, but if you do, you'll notice that cryptocurrencies are very, very highly correlated. They, they tend to go up together or go down together. And what I think that means, but again, 
to the extent that anyone knows what anything means. Like, what I think that means is that people believe that this space is kind of either going to succeed or fail. They don't think they can pick the winners in the space. Like, if I thought search was going to be the, the, like, people are never going to be able to find things on the internet. Search is the next best thing. Okay. But is it Google, Lycos, Excite, AltaVista, Ask Jeeves? Like, how the heck would I know? I would have to look at great detail at all of those projects. And even then, because, you know, Lycos might be on top today, does that mean Google isn't going to come up with a better technology tomorrow? It's like, you, it's hard to pick the winners inside the space. So we need, we want like the whole ecosystem to grow. We want the whole space to succeed. And so right now we're, we're building out that, we're continuing to build out that network for banks and financial institutions and, and, and large corporates. And then we're trying to sort of grow the ecosystem so that we solve the technological problems that we have. And we have all the pieces that Ripple can't build. We can't, Ripple cannot build a whole new financial system. We just can't. And you know, and that 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 is very refreshing because we, you know, you you cannot always at this early stage pick the winners and losers. Right. So you want all boats to rise. Uh, so you know, most people who are who follow uh, cryptocurrencies realize that we have cryptocurrencies and we have the ledger <coughs> that stores all the transactions. So one of the questions, David, I wanted to ask you was if you look at Ripple and XRP and look at the ledger underlying it. What kind of improvements have you made to the Bitcoin blockchain or the Bitcoin ledger? Well, so in the very beginning, um, we built a federated, what, what <coughs> engineers and computer scientists would call a federated Byzantine agreement model instead of proof of work. And one of the first challenges that we had after we said, like, can we actually make this work? And like, okay, we can make this work. But the next challenge we had is like, what is it good for? What can it do better than, than existing? You know, if you invented a new material, but it was really heavy, really expensive, it rusted really easily, it wasn't very strong, you'd be like, cool, we built a new material. Like, now let's go build something else, right? So it's like, it had certain characteristics, and we we're like, what problems can it solve that proof of work maybe isn't as good at solving because of those different characteristics? And the first thing that we hit on was a cross-currency system. So one of the big differences between federated Byzantine agreement and mining is when you mine and you in a proof of work system, the miner who mines a particular block gets to choose every transaction in that block. So they're the sort of dictator of the moment. And they're completely self-interested. They're not trying to help you out, right? They're trying to help themselves out. So now imagine if you had like the New York Stock Exchange and a different self-interested party ran it for every, every 10 minutes. Boy, that would look a lot different than the, the New York Stock Exchange. So what we thought of is, we don't have a, a dictator. Every transaction is voted on by a majority, and the, that majority is selected for the fact that they pick transactions in an unbiased way. Like if someone picks transactions in a biased way, you just stop listening to them. And so we thought, what could we target? And we thought we could target an exchange system where people want to trade one currency or one asset for another. And so we built the ledger from the beginning as a multi-currency ledger. And I think that we built in peer-to-peer um, -peer credit and lending, so like I can extend credit to people and they can sort of draw on that. Um, and I think, I think that's probably um, the, key dif the key difference, I think. I would say one other difference that is Bitcoin uses, I don't, know how, I don't want to get too technical, but Bitcoin, the transactions are the, the, the primary thing. Like the ledger in Bitcoin is a set of transactions. They call them UTXOs, unspent transaction outputs. Ripple's ledger design is a collection of accounts with balances, much more like a traditional bank. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of both approaches, but one of the big advantages of an account approach is like, let's say you're a charity and you've told people to send payment to a particular Bitcoin address. And let's say you have somebody who processes those payments for you and you want to change who processes them. You're like, I don't want this guy to process them, I want some other guy to process them. You actually have to change your receiving address. You have to give everybody a new address to send money to because the other guy, the guy you don't want to use anymore has the keys to that address. When you have an account on a ledger, that account has properties and you can change them. So one property can be who can sign for that account and you could actually change it without having to move funds or give a new receiving address. And so some of the properties that we added to the ledger were built around that fund, those two fundamental differences. The fact that you don't have a dictator at the moment and the pro fact that you have an account that you can manage and that led to some other design decisions down the road. But th that's sort of the core of the differences. Well, that, that's very cool actually. So I want to take one of the things you said about Ripple supporting multiple currencies. So within the account context, I, I mean, I personally think that would be very useful. How does that work? Well, it, it's actually, it, it's a little complicated. I try to think of a way to simplify it. And it's interesting that I can sort of use some of the new terminology that we have now to describe it. But that doesn't, that kind of gives you the technology, but not the spirit. Um, so the technology, it's like to give you the technology side, if you have an account on the XRP ledger, which you can do just by having some XRP, you can issue an asset denominated in any denomination you want. So I can say, and you can think of it as an IOU. You can say, I owe you $100. Now, if there are people 
who owe me money and people I owe money to, that can be used as a, that, th those IOUs can circulate as currency. It, it works the same way a check does. Like if I want to pay you money and I give you a check, you could theoretically say, hey, I have a check from David for $50. He's paid me, everything is settled. But you don't want me to owe you $50, right? You want your bank to owe you $50. So what you do is you take that bank and you give it to some system that processes it. And what happens is I wind up, somebody winds up owing me $50 less, like my bank, and somebody winds up owing you $50 more, your bank. And then it's all magically settled inside. That magical settlement inside, we built into the XRP ledger from day one. And so what that allows you to do is that allows you to have dollars that are an actual legal obligation on the ledger. There are companies, Bitstamp and GitHub are examples. You send them dollars in the real world, you actually you know, wire money to them or however you do it, and they push a dollar balance on the ledger to you. And if you trust Bitstamp or GitHub and they owe you money, you can give that IOU back to them and they'll wire you money in the physical world. And now let's say you don't want to do business with GitHub or Bitstamp, you're not in the same jurisdiction as them. It doesn't matter. That digital asset will be worth a dollar to people who do do business with them. So you can use it as a payment asset, you can accept it in payment, you could trade it for other assets, just as if you did do business with you know, GitHub or Bitstamp. And you have your choice of which assets you want to use, and we built an exchange in, so you have an order book with buy and sell offers to trade one asset for another. And the last thing that we added, which I think is incredibly cool, is pathfinding. So if you have some asset, let's say you have dollars that Bitstamp owes you, and you want to use them to pay XRP to someone, if you buy down the order book, like this is a juicy offer at the top, but as you go further down the order book, the offers get progressively worse and worse. You're, you're, you're buying down that order book. What you can do is you can specify a sort of multiple path payment that buys down one order book and then goes to some other path. So if you have dollars issued by Bitstamp, maybe someone is willing to trade that for XRP, but maybe someone's willing to trade that for Bitcoin and someone's willing to trade those Bitcoins for XRP, or you can take multiple paths and a single payment. And um, I think that that's kind of how we built that multi-currency asset. And, and that's where you definitely don't want a dictator who controls the system. No, it, and, you know, the way I'm thinking about it, it actually gives you flexibility and you don't know what kind of financial assets or digital assets or instruments people might create in the future that could still work on this ledger. So here's the depressing part. So we built that in 2012 and introduced it to the public and we had exactly the excitement that you just, and I thought, wow, like this is super cool and I thought of all these amazing use cases like peer-to-peer -peer lending and social credit and all of those things. And now, fast forward to today, what percentage of asset movements on the XRP ledger do you think are these kinds of assets? It's like 0.2%. Why is that? I think the idea is way ahead of its time. Oh, yeah. I hope that's the reason. I hope it's not that it's a bad idea. I accept the possibility. <laughs> it could just be a terrible idea. I think it's a great idea. I think it's still <laughs> ahead of its time. So, so all that capability is still there in the XRP ledger. There are still people who use it. There are a lot of people who think it's the coolest thing. I, I had dinner with someone last night who didn't know any of this. So I was like, wow, that's super cool. And I'm like, well, then here's the depressing part. You know? And I told them exactly what I just told you. That's all there. And I hope that people find something exciting in it, but um, has not happened yet. So, you know, so in this room, we will stipulate that that's a good idea. It's just ahead of its time. Okay? I mean, it's it was $8 million a day was being traded. I don't know by who or for what in, in, the, in this way. It was moving around on the ledger during, the, during like a year and a half ago. $8 million a day. And now it's down to something like $300,000 a day. And again, I don't know who's doing it or what they're using it for. So I don't know whether it was cryptocurrency related in the crypto winter or they found better, or maybe it was remittances and they found other ways to do it, or I, I don't know. But it, it is a little depressing. You know, sometimes when you're in there and you see everything, it can be depressing. But my, my usual approach is to not lose the optimism of the idea and the vision. And that, you know, that's going to be my advice to everyone over there. I, so still, I still hope it's ahead of yeah. its time, and I talk yeah. to people about it, and, I and, and we're hearing some projects that are interested in using stuff for it, but again, product market fits tough, and that's right. we'll see. I, actually, that's a good segue to my next question. So what interesting use cases are you seeing out there for ledgers, for distributed ledgers, for crypto, <laughs> outside of the payment arena? So that's, that's unfortunately, again, it's a little depressing. The further you get away from payments, the poorer with today's technology the product market fit is. But you know, like if, if I drove here in a Model T and, I, you, and I, I, we couldn't vision, uh, visualize you know, trucks and, and sports cars and SUVs and we have a Model T today um, and we want to replace the horse. So 
we have a lot of we have a lot of work to do. Uh, so payments is the obvious slam dunk. International payments, payment areas where there's tremendous friction is the obvious. Then there's like really directly affiliated use cases, things like lending, things like trade finance, um, things that are really closely connected to finance, maybe settling securities trades. But then as you get further away, people talk about like avocado farmers or providence of art, and, and all of those things are interesting, but it's much harder to see product market fit. Uh, the, 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 I have to do this terrible thing. So, so when people ask for a use case, what, you, what they want to hear is like a specific, like this person has this need and this product satisfies it. And I have to do this cheater answer where I say, any time you need, and then I list the characteristics of the technology. And that's cheating because that's not a use case, no, right? That, that's valuable though. But the, the, the answer is sort of any time where you need a system, but you don't want to pick someone to run it. Like, you, you, like there's advantages to the management being decentralized. There's, there's advantages to the data being fundamentally public. There's advantages to nobody having control over how the system runs. Like where those, and the obvious ones of those are where money is involved because people are in different jurisdictions. And, but the other thing is also any case where like you would benefit from having a perfect legal system. So like a perfect legal system would have no cases. Uh, if I ripped you off for $100 and we went to a perfect legal system, they would make you pay me, I would make me pay you the $100 plus cost. So I would just give you the $100 and not bother. Like any case where you want to kind of build a sort of perfect legal system and where it fits. But unfortunately, hard time with, with use case fit. I'm very bullish on the technology because I think that compared, like everybody says, why wouldn't you just use a centralized database? Well, they imagine that centralized databases are cheap and reliable. That is nonsense. Every centralized, every major centralized database has downtime. No major blockchain has had any downtime in the past three years. Centralized databases are cheap. Go to, go to any, co pharmaceutical companies went to companies to run a centralized database for them to move vaccines and they were quoted many millions of dollars a year. But Blockchains anyone, don't cost Anyone that. who tells me a centralized database is cheap, I give, send them a picture of Larry Ellison's yacht. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Definitely not cheap. These are these are these 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 earlier tech. These are being oversold. Yeah. We're being told that like, oh, it's just really simple to bring a conventional database. It, it's it's not. And the security is critical too. So I think the key insight of blockchain is every participant can verify every system state transition. Anytime the database goes from state A to state B, every participant who wants to can verify that state transition. And even more importantly, the only way to go from state A to state B is to demonstrate that that transition like complies with the system's rules. When you operate a centralized system, huge amounts of the cost are, are built around making sure that bad data doesn't get into the system, making sure that the data doesn't get corrupted. If you can't pass corrupt data on, that whole operational cost center and risk center goes away. Now that's not to say that blockchains don't have any security problem. I don't want to oversell blockchains, but, I, but that's like why I'm super excited about the space, even though we don't quite have this product market fit. It's very early days. We have a Model T or you know, it's early days of the internet. I have a modem that you know, cost me 300 bucks and I'm editing DOS batch files to you know, get, <laughs> get a text-based, get FTP and, and go for it. you have 480 kilobytes of RAM. Right, Ex yeah, it's early days, and, but, but it's super exciting. And so I, I wanna get people excited into the space, but I, I'll be very honest about what we can't do today. Like we don't have the slam dunk see-through to you know, putting everything on the blockchain. And probably some things won't work well on a blockchain. Like I'm not, I'm not arguing that it will do everything. I'm just arguing it can do a lot more than we're using it for as we grow the technology because a lot of the limitations are not fundamental. Great. So if, you know, the, a lot of people talk about this. Uh, for example, Jamie Dimon will say, you know, I think he doesn't say this anymore, but he says crypto is crap, but he likes the ledger. So I wanted to get a, your point of view on is, is, there, is that separable, the currency, the token, and the ledger? or they kind of go hand in hand. So right now, these dollar, these financial use cases are the ones that seem like the best product market fit. They're the ones that are getting the most traction. Uh, will it turn out that they, uh, I think there's a fundamental reason for that, which is that people want control over the flow of money. I think people are, um, are, are not happy with the fact that the current control over funds is being used um, as a as sort of a tool to control people. And if they don't have to, if they don't have to have gatekeepers to the financial system, they don't have to have gatekeepers to information, and so they tore down the old walls. They built new ones, so maybe, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I, at, least, at least he's bullish on the technology, so yes. I'll say that's a plus. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a plus, but I, do, I also think that there are a lot of financial uh, system problems that this settle. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the, we had a revolution in the movement of goods. We had, you know, shipping, we had the, con the shipping container, which don't underestimate how revolutionary that was. Like that's what led, started like globalization of like farming. 
Um, and then we had a revolution in the internet where we could move information. Well, what's the piece that's missing is the movement of, of money. You know, if I can find out what goods you have for sale and you could get those goods to me, I gotta pay you. Like that is a huge mission, missing piece. And I, I, I know, I mean, he's in a position where his revenue model is based on the money moving through him mm -hmm. and some of it sort of doesn't quite get from the source to the destination. Uh, I think I, I think that the gate, just like the gate, the New York Times probably wasn't big on the internet in the early Absolutely. days, you know. So I mean, it's going to take some time for the people who benefit from the way the system is, and 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 maybe he's right. Maybe the the use cases will be elsewhere. It doesn't look like that today, though. At least not from my point no, of view. No, I I don't think so. I I mean, there were there were those when the PC came out, there were those who owned the mini computer business that said you won't. There's no need for PCs. And when the mini computer came out, those that owned the mainframe said there was no need for mini computers. So. That's, we've seen that history repeat itself over and over again, and I, <coughs> I feel like that's gonna be, you know, be in that mode that this happens. Sony was probably not big on the iPod. <laughs> Sony? Oh yeah, yeah that's that, a company. That, that yeah, 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 company. that music company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but, but you, see, you, see the, you see the example here. So like the iPod came out of a computer company, why? It could have come from Sony, but it didn't. Sony could have embraced digital downloads. The iPod could have been a Sony product. They could have been a big player in the digital music space, but that's not what happened. Apple was a computer company, and they saw digital downloads happening, and they embraced it when the original music company was like, we really understand how to sell physical CDs. We really understand how to sell physical records and tapes. That's our business, We want, and people seem to like it. So why would we try to do something else that's not our business? Well, people stopped liking it, didn't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot more people in this room have, uh, have buy digital downloads than buy you know CDs or tapes <coughs> or records. Probably a couple of you buy records because apparently that's coming back. But yeah, vinyl's <laughs> coming back. I heard. <laughs> Just like bell bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so David, turning to like say recent news, you know, in the I don't know where it was, but HTC announced a new phone, their Exodus, Exodus, and they have a crypto wallet. Mm -hmm. Give us your kind of thinking around, you know, what are they thinking and where could, how could this help us grow the ecosystem? Well, you know, people laugh, why would <coughs> anyone want a blockchain phone? And honestly, that was like my first reaction. But you know, um, it, it was a famous executive at, at Microsoft who once said, who wants a phone shaped like a slice of toast? Well, my phone is shaped like a slice of toast. This is exactly the form factor that he was mocking. And it's the most popular form factor today. I bet probably 80% of you in here have a phone shaped like a slice of toast. And at one time, when the first internet connected phones came out, people were like, why would you want a phone connected to the internet? What sense does that make? I mean, I, I'm wary of saying that I don't see the fit because people in the past who haven't seen the, the, the track record of people you know, shaking their fists at the sky uh, that way is not, is not so good. So, so I'm enthusiastic. I'm, I'm excited to see those kinds of developments. I don't think we're ready for mass retail adoption, though. Like bluntly, I don't think. I think we need to build a much stronger ecosystem before we're ready to do that. But I don't want to discourage the people who think we are, because if I'm wrong and I discourage them, that'd be a terrible thing. It would be great. There's going to be some path to mass adoption. It's just very hard to see right now. We're still very early. Okay. So, what do you feel are the research problems? You know, we have some students in the room. If people are looking at research problems to solve, what are some of the research problems that have to be solved before we can get to mass adoption? There are a lot. <laughs> there are a lot. That's one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, so one of them is quantum computing. Quantum computing is threatening the algorithms that blockchains use. And the current crop of quantum resistant algorithms is not very good for blockchains. We'd use them if we had to, but we'd be very sad about that. Like We'd like to have algorithms that are really good for our use case. We don't have them. Governance is really weird in these systems. We, how does Bitcoin governance work? Well, we didn't know until someone tried to change the block size, right? And we had a sort of bit of a holy war and a split in the value. Like, we'd like to understand how do you govern these kinds of systems? Who holds the real, like, what do you have to do to get a change through? Like, who, who has to agree? Who are the real stakeholders? Where is the value coming from? We don't understand any of that. Zero knowledge proofs have made possible many use cases that, that blockchains couldn't target. We've developed fundamentally new cryptographic primitives in just the last couple of years in this area. It's cr tremendously exciting and powerful, and we need more of it, like because this is enabling us to target use cases that we didn't think we could target. Um, and I would say also distributed agreement algorithms. Um, scalab uh, scalability also. Scalability is a big one. Like if we could, there are a number of projects out looking at scaling blockchains in a number of different ways, and they're all interesting. 
But it would be not, the holy grail would be one thing that's just like, you just do this and your blockchain becomes scalable. Like that would be fantastic. <laughs> I don't know that that exists. But, but we, need a, we need better, you know, we need better right suggestions in that direction. But I would also add that like I'm, I'm a technical person and so I see sort of like the crypto side and some of the governance stuff. But there's issues on the financial side and legal, regulatory, like what, who are the good guys and bad guys? How do you tell the difference? You know, um, there's all kinds of questions, questions about like what are the effects that this has on society? How do, we, how do we prevent new gatekeepers from emerging? Like how do we, privacy is a good example. Like people say they care about privacy, but we built an ecosystem where privacy is terrible. Well, how do we not repeat that kind of mistake? Like what do we have, how do we know, how do, what are the early signs? What could we have done better? It, it, there's just it, this cross-disciplinary research needed everywhere in this, enti this entire space. And I, I can only tell you the ones that like impact what I'm doing directly. So don't let that discourage you and think if uh, something didn't seem important to me, it's not important. Like we need every, I, I can't imagine any discipline that this doesn't touch. So David, you, you talked about char characteristics of use cases. Can I also ask you to talk about characteristics of the governance that you think would help with adoption, would help with? So help this, is, this is an extremely interesting situation because there's no coercion. Nobody has a legal right to run these systems any particular way. The governance emerges from the code people choose to run. So for example, when Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash split, you would wind up on Bitcoin or Bitcoin Cash depending on what code you chose to run on your computer. And so you pick a side um, or you pick both sides. Um, but then the economic value of those systems kind of divided somehow, and we don't really know how. So, like, if you want to make a change to a system, these systems are going to have to make changes. If, if, if these systems can never make changes, they're going to be vulnerable to techn technological obsolescence. And I think that probably is, that could be one way. Like, Bitcoin might stay relevant until some technology is so much better than Bitcoin that Bitcoin dies. And Bitcoin can't change because people are so invested in the stability of the system. Like the Bitcoin's value is that it will work next year the same way it works today. And so they can't change. And so they die from like technological obsolescence. But that's kind of depressing, especially if you own a bunch of Bitcoin, right? Like that's kind of, but it seems like you should be able to like innovate without disrupting, without being incredibly disruptive. And, and not every change is gonna be non-controversial. So who are the stakeholders? How do you get their agreement? Do you have a foundation? Do you have one guy who's like the benevolent dictator or, or a panel of people like that worked well for Bitcoin until it didn't? So like, is that a good model where there's like this person that everybody trusts? Like, but what if you can't, like, even if that's the best model, like you're not, you're not always gonna find that person. Bitcoin doesn't have anybody in that role anymore. And so how can we keep these public systems accessed by people in different jurisdictions I, I don't, I, I, str I struggle for answers. So right now it's basically almost just a fight. Like someone proposes a change and some people make the change and some don't and then the network either splits or it doesn't. Exchanges hold a lot of power today but they don't want to wield it. Exchanges sometimes have no choice. Like in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cash split, some exchanges said like, we'll support both coins. Well, that's great or not. You know, <laughs> some of the value of these systems comes from the fact that you can reach all the other people on that system. So. I'm not an expert in this. I don't know how, to, I, I, I always find the problems hardest that I don't know how to solve and I always find problems inside the disciplines that I'm knowledgeable in to be easier because I can kind of see how you would solve them. Um, I'm told that they're actually experts in this and that they, uh, I wanna find them. <laughs> I'm told that they're, they, I, uh, one analogy one, or one discipline that might be closely related is open source projects. So. Linux, like Linus Torvalds can say what Linux is, but he can't stop me from developing a branch of Linux that I call something else. And if I get a lot of traction because people like my branch, then maybe more developers will move and maybe his branch will die. And maybe like Linux might be a terrible example because that's had one person who's had everybody's respect and has run the project. But there are other projects that haven't been that way. And so looking at how did power transition in those projects, what kind of governance structures did they use? Did they create foundations? What are the learnings? How did that work? How, Bitcoin created a foundation. How did that work? How did it not? But I don't, I don't know. That's why I find these problems so interesting. No, th they are interesting and in some sense sometimes, you know, the word governance conjures up centralization for people. Because it historically always has it been, It historically right? always has been. That's what makes it so weird. Yeah, and, that, and, and, and when you look at it in the de decentralized world. Nobody has a stick, right? If somebody has a, has a stick, yeah. then the stick guy yeah. decides how we make the rules. But if nobody has a stick, yeah, and, and by the way, in my very first job many, many decades ago, my boss told me his boss's boss was known as the benevolent dictator. 
and he was lying about one of those adjectives, but <laughs> he wasn't going to tell me which one. I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> not dictator. <laughs> so yeah, that's not a great that's not a great model. Like a lot of projects start out that way because there's someone who everybody agrees like has the project's best interest because they're aligned. But then as it starts to uh, get value, or 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 target different use cases, and there's discord. Like the ability of a single person to hold everybody's respect or. It's, it's impossible for a long period of time. Right. So we need to have something to go to. Mm -hmm. And the sort of everybody for themselves, just whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Um, maybe that is the best solution. Maybe we can't do any better than what Bitcoin has. I don't know. I tend to think, though, no, that there should be. No, I think that's still be. an open question. There's still, that's still I, open. I would agree with you. De so what does decentralized governance look like? That yeah. oxymoron. What would, so I wanted to leave some time for questions from you all. What kind of questions do you all have bubbling up as you've listened to this conversation play out in front of you and as you kind of see the world of cryptocurrencies happen. Yes, Jonathan. I actually have a question for uh, David. <coughs> um, what, are, what do you see the differences between um, asset issuance on other platforms like Ethereum and asset issuance on Ripple? So asset issuance on the XRP ledger didn't really take off. Um, it was our early strategy. Ripple as a company kind of abandoned that strategy as we pursued other things, and, and uh, it didn't really take off. Through our spring effort, we're sort of revisiting whether that makes sense, whether we want like stable coins. Or, or one interesting thing is trustless gateways, so that you can have a token that lives on more than one ledger without having to trust some, somebody to, to hold it. Um, I think it's kind of good that the XRP ledger sort of sat out the ICO boom bust cycle. I think it was kind of damaging to the Ethereum ecosystem that they had issues where the, the blockchain became completely congested and unusable because like CryptoKitties caught on and some of these projects were, were ill thought out. Um, I think that ecosystem has matured, but I think, I think that it's interesting that we didn't go through that sort of stress period. Um, there's nobody who's actively working to encourage token issuance on the XRP ledger, really, because there isn't a good use. There isn't really a good use case fit. So uh, it, it's available. You can, you know, you can. If someone, if you have some XRP, you can issue an asset on the XRP ledger immediately, and you, people can hold it, and you can trade it, and you can do anything you want with it. But uh, but there's a there's a dearth of use cases right now, and we're looking for people who are interested in use cases, and we do hear those kind. We do have people who approach us, and they're talking about like maybe we'll issue securities on the ledger, and then we'll tokenize them that way, or maybe we'll do our next IC, an, an ICO that way. Um, maybe stable co stable coins, I think, are probably the the use case that I can see the clearest line to. Um, but I, I don't know. It's it. It's kind of depressing to me because I think we built this really cool system that supports this trading and issuing of assets, and it's just there's no good use case. Again, I like to think it's ahead of its time. I hope I'm right. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so how does PolySign plan on solving current issues with digital asset blockchains? You know, for example, uh, when the crypto.com unlocks assets, all money, when it's a secret, stolen a lot of funds in order to recover. God, I really wish I could answer that. But I'm under a non-disclosure agreement with PolySign, and I don't. And because they're in stealth mode right now, I don't know what I'm allowed to tell you. Okay. I can tell you that they're in the custody business, and of course, I can tell you that they're doing it like an amazing way. That you know, Arthur and I are behind this. We're the lead guys on the technology, and obviously, like we're doing it. We think we're doing it right, but uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm under. I don't know what. I really wish I could tell you because it's so freaking cool. I just, I'm busting with wanting to tell people what we did, and they're like, oh no, it's still, we're still in Seth mode, it's still non disclosure. So unfortunately, I cannot answer that question, but I, I feel guess, really bad about it. I guess can I ask one more? I guess, in, uh, you know, in the cryptographic you know, valuation model, since Susan and Anthony uh, published uh, its high estimate for Ethereum's XRP adoption, uh, Forex trading said for 3% of global Forex. Like, do you guys, do you believe that's a high estimate, or uh, like, what do you, like, what do you think of that? I, you know, this is an, this is an answer that, that I'll be completely honest, because obviously I would like to say that I like to think that it can take over the world. But I, in my heart of hearts, I believe that these prices are rational. I know that sounds crazy, but in my heart of hearts, I believe that like if this price was really, if, if the price of any digital asset was really irrational, there are billionaires who have access to the cryptocurrency market. Like if the price of any cryptocurrency didn't accurately reflect its long-term prospects, why wouldn't some billionaire buy a crap ton of it? You know, and, and bid the price up. Like, I, I don't, I can't wrap my head around how these markets could really be irrational. I'm not an economist, and there are people who tell me that I'm out of my mind about that, but that is true. I, I recognize I'm, I'm a pining outside of my area of expertise, but that is really, like, in my heart of hearts, what I believe. I believe 
these markets have to be rational because I don't see, not necessarily that every spike is rational, there aren't pump and dumps or, or fake volume, not that everything, but that the course pricing has to be, how could it not be, come on. And so if Bitcoin had a 2% chance of taking over to a trillion dollars the economy or XRP had a 50% chance of getting 6% of the forest market, how could it be that like some billionaire isn't like, oh yeah, I see that and buying billions of dollars. Like there's enough money, there's enough self-interested people who have access to the markets. I can't believe, I just, again, I'm not an economist and so I, I'm, I'm explicitly warning you, this is just how I as a non-expert feel. I cannot make myself believe that the prices are fundamentally irrational. Thank you. Other questions for David? I'll go here and then come back. So I'll start from the bottom tier up because there's a couple of tiers in the way it functions. So at the bottom tier, there is somebody who has, um, let's, say, let's say we're going US dollars to Mexican pesos. There's someone who has dollars in an exchange. They buy XRP, they send it to a Mexican exchange, they sell XRP, and then some payout company makes a payment through the Mexican domestic financial system. The XRAPID customer, if you're the actual person who signed a contract with Ripple, you're an XRAPID customer, you own those exchange accounts and that relationship with the payment provider. That's yours. So you now have the ability to make payments out in Mexico using liquidity sourced on demand. That's an ability that you have. You can, in principle, do whatever you want with that, uh, using that, that. So that's like the second tier. Now, the third tier is let's say I'm a bank and I can't hold XRP. It's just like it's infeasible for me from a regulatory standpoint. However, if I want to make a payment and I have US dollars and I want to make a payment in Mexican pesos, you could say, I'll give you those pesos. I don't have to care how you get them. The fact, uh, in most regulatory environments, like I, I have to know that you're regulated and that you're not, you know, like getting them from North Korea or something. But like in general, it's not a big deal for me to get Mexican pesos from another another institution that happened to trade a digital asset to get those Mexican pesos. Because today, if I send Mexican pesos, my bank has no idea whose Mexican pesos are going to be delivered anyway. So you can go to other Ripple Net customers who may who are probably not X Rapid customers and aren't interested in being X Rapid customers, and you can resell your U.S. to Mexico pipeline to them. And you just give them a quote. So I'm making a payment to Mexico. I push it out on RippleNet, and you give me a quote. You say, I can give you those 53 Mexican pesos for you know, $22. I'm like, cool, I'll take that. Um, and so that's how, that, that's how it's here. So at the bottom, you have the sort of cryptocurrency plumbing. In the middle, you might have the XRAPID customer. They might just be trading on their own book. If they're a mittens company, they're trading for their own customers, and that's fine. But they can also resell that capability on RippleNet so that entities that can't establish exchange relationships or can't hold the cryptocurrency even for two minutes um, can still use it. Now, in that transaction, you're buying XRP and selling it within a minute or two. The liquidity, the volatility of XRP in two minutes is better than the volatility of Mexican pesos over a couple hours. So, so the, liquid, the volatility is kind of lost in the noise. It also helps you as often as it hurts you. So it's not, uh, for some customers who are really worried about that, like we'll agree to take the, their losses in exchange for their profits. And it's like they never, they never get any money from us. And they're like, why are we doing, why are we giving you these, these profits? Like, so you do that, then this how much does Ripple care really if somebody's integrated through directly through Ripple versus somebody else that's just forced? So like, who cares at all? Really? I mean, it's in the end, always open source. The usage of the network is kind of broken. Like, where, where it comes in, regardless of maybe the integration contract that you have with Ripple, how that much you care? Not that much. One of the major things that we want is more liquidity moving through cryptocurrency markets. So what's happening today is there's lots of liquidity and move, movement of money in cryptocurrency <laughs> markets, but, but what it is is it's speculators trading against market makers, and that doesn't make a healthy economy because the speculator is always trying to like beat the market maker. So I see XRP go up, and I try to take all your XRP a millisecond faster than, and so how do you protect yourself against that? You make really small offers with really big spreads. Now, if most of the people who were taking your offers just needed to make a payment, they're not trying to trade against you, you'll make more money. And so you'll make bigger offers with a tighter spread, or I'll take, if you're making lots of money, I'm gonna come in and make a little bit less, right? Um, so we need to get, to fix like the cryptocurrency liquidity problem, we need to bring market takers who are not speculators to the party. 
And if we do that ourselves, that's great. If somebody else wants to do that without us having to, that's great. Like, if you want to solve the problem, we just need that problem solved. We need the ecosystem to have better liquidity so people can use cryptocurrencies. Today, you can use them in cases where the existing system is really bad. Like, US to Mexico is pretty bad. Um, but US to Europe is great. Like, you, it, they're not cost effective because the spreads are too big, the liquidity is too thin. So, yeah, if someone else wants, if, if someone wants to do it some other way, we're perfectly, we're perfectly happy. We do these things because we need them, right? Not necessarily because we think that that's where you're going to make a whole bunch of money or that's not like our business strategy to own those parts. And then, therefore, the project behind regular sort of full clarity is just liquidity instead of the biggest kind of Yeah, and I, I would say one other thing which is closely related is it's very difficult for conventional companies to like dip their toes into the cryptocurrency space because banks will cut them off and they'll, they'll run into other problems. The regulatory clarity is even more worse. Like, like I would say number one is regulatory clarity. Just what we don't know is legal. It's not bad laws. It's just we don't know what the law is or how it applies. And then liquidity and then th this inability for people who might want to solve some of those problems, but then they find that they'll get cut off from their existing banks. So they discovered that their contracts with their existing banks actually have a clause that says they can't touch cryptocurrencies. Like we found that happen. So those are kind of the obstacles. If other people want to work on those obstacles, that's great. That's just one less thing we have to do to be successful. I'm, I'm happy with that. Thank you very much for your question. Go ahead. I guess that's a good segue into what I want to ask. Um, the SEC tweeted that they are putting cryptocurrency regulation at the forefront of the NOC this year. Assuming that everything is settled by the NOC, how is that going to uh, look for adoption in the NOC? It's really hard to say how much of an effect that's having. Um, I, th I, I thought initially that it was having a lot of effect because people were, were afraid that like the SEC was just going to do something drastic in the short term. I think now it, it's, very, it's, it's, very hard, it's very hard to say. I would say that the benefits of any kind of regulatory clarity, even if they're no, you can't do that, I think that's probably better than like, yeah, maybe you could do, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of in a funny situation because we've been completely transparent about everything we've been doing since day one. We meet with regulators all the time. It seems kind of strange that they would say after seven years, everything that you've been doing since day one is violating this fundamental law that everybody knows in this clear and obvious way. That seems like a really strange thing to have happen. On the other hand, it seems strange that they would say, like, everybody's fine with everything they're doing, too. So where, what lines are they going to, and there's no obvious, it, there's no obvious set of lines, so it's going to be, inter I'm interested to see. Obviously, we're engaging with regulators around the world, including the SEC, and we're trying to make the case for, uh, um, you know, them, them trying, to pre trying to prevent, like, outright scams without squashing innovation. It's, it's, it's challenging. I wish I could just tell them, this is the rule that you should adopt. This is a clear rule. It, it sorts the good guys from the bad guys. Just pass this law. Uh, I, I, I have not seen that rule yet, so I, I think it's going to be, it's going to have to be squishy. Which is we have, disappointing. You have time for maybe one or two more questions, if there are any. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, you mentioned being able to send and receive US dollars on the Ripple ledger. Uh, do I need XRP to settle those transactions, or is it, is, I guess, Ripple, is it more of a payment system or a cryptocurrency? You just need XRP to, to pay the transaction fees, which are some tiny, tiny, it's a microscopic amount. You can use an account on the XRP ledger completely to transact in other currencies and issued assets and essentially these IOUs. Um, and in the early days, that was kind of the business use case that Ripple as a company was pushing. That has not really caught on, and so we've kind of, but I still think it's incredibly cool. Um, since I have an opportunity to make one of the case, Ryan Fugger is the guy who originally came up with that idea in the original Ripple Pay, and he had this idea that instead of currencies being issued by a government and by a central party, he had this idea that, like, I help you move, and you decide you owe me 50 bucks. And instead of you pay, settling that, what happens is we track this obligation. Like, you have a positive $50 obligation, I have a minus 50, or the other way, depending on who helps who. And that, that could be currency, and we could trade that as currency. And, and people who, you could have these sort of central hubs that lots of people wanna, want to owe the money because they have a store or something. And like, these IOUs could trade as currency. And we built that into the ledger, and I still think that's super cool. And um, yeah, I, I would encourage you to find out more about it and, uh, and learn to use it and, and see how incredibly cool it is. Because I tell you about it so many times, I'm like, oh gosh, that's so cool. I had no idea. I saw one chart that listed all these different ledgers, and under XRP ledger or the decentralized exchange, there wasn't a checkbox. Because we're the first decentralized exchange in 2012. That's one of the cool things. Obviously, we're not getting the word out. <laughs> <laughs> one more question. Go ahead, please. Was there, was there plans for a pool of XRP to be built for customers to pull from and instead from other sources? 
And was there any sense to like the skid marks or ice cubes? <laughs> So first of all, I'm definitely not allowed to say anything about Expol. Um, but, but yeah, there definitely is this idea. So we really don't want to be in the business of like providing XRP to people for transactions because our whole point is to grow the ecosystem. And like if people are just, and then that becomes a sale from our point of view. And so then if we don't want to sell XRP, we wind up having to buy it back somewhere, which is it's a little awkward for us to be trading on both sides of a market just from a sort of regular, just from a like squeaky clean hands. It's like, oh yeah, we're selling XRP over here and we're buying it over here. And we have all this inside information that you might think has something to do with the price. Like that looks ugly. And so we don't want to do that unless we have to. What we would prefer to do is partner with exchanges or partner with somebody else. And, and we've done that. So we have like X Rapid preferred partners who we have agreements with to make sure that they meet certain service level agreements. Yeah, it, it's, it's awkward for us to do that. Um, we've thought about things like that where we couldn't find other solutions. And to date, we've been able to find other solutions in most of the places where we have that issue. So we want people buying on the, if, if you're buying to make a transaction, we want you buy, we really want you buying on the open market. Because otherwise we're basically, like if, otherwise like if we discount it to you, we're basically just giving you money, which like if we wanted to give you money, we wouldn't need to c create this con contrived way to do it. So, and, and we wanna make sure that we're proving the actual use case. So like if, if, sure, you would love to make payments with XRP if you could get XRP at a discount. Like if you could get dollars at a discount, right? You'd, you'd do great in the payment business. Like that doesn't prove, that just proves that if you pay people to do something, they'll do it, which is non-controversial, right? Like you have to, it can, it, it can interfere with making sure that you actually have a fit. And we don't want people to sort of be paid to suffer using a product that doesn't work for them. So you gotta be really careful uh, that boundary between incentivizing people to participate and, and fooling yourself into thinking that you're getting traction. But thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your questions. Thank you, David, for coming. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much.